beginning at verse 34, going down through verse number 38, Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, 34 through 38. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Thousands of people followed Jesus everywhere he went when he was walking on this earth. At one time, he fed 5,000. At another time, he fed 4,000. And when he preached the Sermon on the Mount, he had to get in the boat and push away from the bank in order for the crowd to hear him. As a matter of fact, as you watch where uh, they suspect Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, the guide will tell you that that was probably a perfect amphitheater that his voice flowed all over that hillside. So they went where he went, everywhere he was, they looked him up, the word got around, and the crowd together. They ate the food that he, he blessed and gave the disciples to distribute. They saw his miracles, they heard his word. But not all of them were his true disciples. Jesus made it clear that discipleship has demands. There are requirements, restrictions. One verse in particular tells us that Jesus told his disciples this in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So he's clarifying here who really is a disciple, not just the ones who come to hear me and to eat the food and, and to see the miracles, but those who continue in my word, who stay with me through the long haul. That's true discipleship. You may be a Christian, you may be a church member, you may even be a church leader, but are you a true disciple of Jesus Christ? In our text, Jesus himself explains what it means to be a true disciple of Christ. And I've chosen to break his words down and present them as four questions as we talk about are you a true disciple of Jesus Christ? Number one, who calls the shots in your life? Who calls the shots in your life? Look at verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciples, then here's what you have to do to become a disciple. And the basic premise is just simply uh, to come after Jesus. In other words, to follow Him. This means you want to go where He goes, you want to do what He's doing, and you want to be who He is. That's true discipleship. And He explained this in three statements. He said, first of all, you have to deny yourself. This is not the same thing that some folks do during Lent. You know, I'm going to give up uh, 
and sometimes it's very ridiculous, something they don't even eat anyway. But it's not something like that, you know, well, I'm going to do without coats for a month or whatever. That's not... Here, here's what deny self. It means to give up yourself. It means not to be the one who bosses your life. Not be the one who decides what you're going to do. The word used here for to deny yourself is the same word that's used when Peter denied the Lord. You remember how adamant he was? I don't know him. He even went so far as to curse. And that was the word used for his denial. So this is pretty, pretty strong for us to deny ourselves. Pride is actually idolatrous worship of self. You worship yourself, it becomes uh, an idol. And that's what pride really is when you begin lift yourself up. So the first thing that he used to describe what it means to be his disciple in coming after him is you've got to deny yourself. Second, he says, take up your cross. Now, your cross is not something you wear on a necklace. A cross is a place to die. When Jesus was commanded to take his cross and take it through the streets of Jerusalem up to the hill of Calvary. He wasn't taking it up there to build a fort or a playhouse. He was taking it up there to die on. And when you take up your cross, that means you're dying to self. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we're to die on a regular basis as Christians. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, he said, I die daily. Which means that I deny myself, I die to what I want, I surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis. We are to welcome those things that help us die to self. Dying to self is one of the hardest things that any person can ever do. This is a radical deviation from the way the world looks at it. First of all, if something difficult comes up, the world says, uh, avoid it, run from it, get away from it. But if you can't run from it, then uh, fight back. Get angry. Uh, speak up. Get even. Jesus said, no. Come die to yourself or take up your cross and follow me. It may be those things that a family member or a friend that they say to you that sting so much that God is going to use to cause you to die to self. I got a suggestion. When someone you love says something that hurts, Turn away and say, thank you, God, for helping me die to self. We, we think we've died to self, but it don't take long for us to push back and demand our rights. This is just not a one-time experience. You have to continually die to yourself until you literally die and go to heaven. But Jesus said, if you come after me, uh, you, have, you have to first of all uh, deny yourself then you have to take up your cross and then you've got to follow me. Now to follow Christ simply means just obey Him. Do what He tells you. Because you can't walk together with Christ unless you be agreed. And you're not going to get Him to agree with your agenda. You've got to agree with what He wants done. So we are to obey Christ and trust Him to meet the need if we do what He tells us to do. Now, let's, if, if you have been reading in the Gospel of Mark, you will notice earlier in the chapter that He had led the disciples to feed the multitude. But here's what He said 
uh, uh, they said, we don't, we don't have any food to feed them. He said, don't send them away hungry. They'll faint along the way. And he said, feed them. And they said, we, we, don't, we don't have that food. He said, just set them down and tell them to get ready to eat. And then what did he do? He took what they had and blessed it and made it more than enough. See, their part wasn't to figure out how to get the food. Their part wasn't to figure out how to multiply the fishes. Their part was to do what he said. And he said, get them ready to eat. And then he made the provision. So we're to do exactly what he tells us to do. Here's one definition of growing in Christ. Is learning to say yes sooner. Have you noticed how uh, we keep putting off surrendering to what he wants? And we fight, and we fight, and we fight, and finally we say yes, and all of a sudden God blesses, and we wonder, <coughs> why did I resist so long? So, growing in Christ is learning to say yes sooner. Uh, following Christ is a lifelong journey. You stay in that mode uh, Deny self, taking up your cross, and following Him as long as you are alive. Each one of these statements that Jesus gave are, in the Greek language, it's present uh, continuous action. And what that means is that it starts now, but it continues. And so, if I were to read that in an accurate understanding, it would be, keep on denying Keep on taking, keep on following. That's what it means, is it's continued. So the question is, who's calling the shots in your life? Question number two, what are you willing to lose your life doing? What are you willing to lose your life doing? Listen to verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels the same shall save it. Many times when we tell others that we're going to take a different route than what folks thought we were going to take, we're going to have some well-meaning souls say, you're throwing your life away. Let me tell you, the decisions we make to follow our heart when God is leading us is not throwing it away. It's reaching out for something better. We often use the term, she's all wrapped up in, and you can tell in the blanks, or he's all wrapped up in. You know what we need to do? The challenge for true disciples is to get all wrapped up in Jesus and in sharing his gospel. It, we are so unfortunate as to be able to get everything you want, you'll end up not wanting everything you have. If you can get everything you want, then you'll find out you really don't want what you have because it will not satisfy. Years ago, the Apostle Paul was brought before Nero. From all indication, Paul was a short man, balding, probably uh, not impressive in his demeanor. He had practically no material possessions, spent most of his ministry life in prison. He was connected to a radical group of um, insignificant folks known as Christians. And he's standing before Nero, the emperor of Rome. Nero had all of the possessions he could want. He had all the power he wanted. He had all the pleasure he wanted. He had a right. 2,000 years later, though, we name our sons Paul... And we name our dogs Nero. It's interesting, isn't it? 
You take it out of the context of the immediate and see what long-term benefits of who you are, and you'll see that all that money and all that power and all that influence is nothing if it's not from God and for God's glory. As you look at the things you're majoring on in your life today, what will you be worth remembering a hundred years from now? The things you're focusing on today, what will be worth remembering a hundred years from now? Question number three. How much is your soul worth? Verses 36 and 37. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So to kind of get into that conversation, I'll ask you a question. What's more important to you? Earthly things or eternity? Which one of those means the most to you. True disciples of Christ should have uh, actually a, a split vision. We only have one eye on our assignment <coughs> and the other eye on the eastern sky expecting the Lord to return. The devil tried to make a deal with Jesus when he was in the wilderness of Judea. <coughs> He wanted him to sell out. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, let, let me read to you verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee if you will fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Do you believe the devil had the authority or the ability to give Jesus all those things that he showed him? I do. See, he's the king of this earth right now. He's having his way in the kingdom of men. God's allowing him to do that. So my question to you is what kind of deal has the devil offered you? He said to Jesus, if you just bow down and worship me, that's not a big deal. I'm going to give you all this. We don't need to sell out. How much is your soul worth? Years ago, Arche arch archaeologists uncovered the tomb of Charlemagne, the emperor of France. When they opened the tomb, they found all the treasures that had been stored with him. And then seated on a throne was the skeletal remains of Charlemagne. And in his lap was an open Bible. And his finger was pointing to this verse. What should it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? How much is your soul worth? How much is your life worth? That's really what many translations. Don't throw your life away on things that are cheap when it can be invested in the things of God. The final question is found in verse 38. Whose opinion do you value? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his angels. Are you ashamed of Jesus? In my study today, I was reading about what one preacher 
heard his son say about, Dad, I, I, I figured out how to say my prayer at lunchtime in school without others laughing at me. He says, I bend over to tie my shoe and say my prayer. And the dad had to admit my son's ashamed of Jesus. Are you ashamed of Jesus? Are you ashamed of his word? You take any textbook, it holds nothing compared to this book. I put this book up against any book that's ever been written. I don't even have to understand or be able to explain all of it. I've learned to believe it because the more I study it, the more I understand and the more truth is confirmed in my soul. So whose opinion do you value? Does the opinion of the world mean more to you than Jesus? What people think about you? And he went on to say, you know, are you going to be ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation? Look around you. Look how they're living. Look what they're saying. Look what they're doing. And you worry about what they think of you? He said, if you are ashamed of me when I come with my Father in my glory and all the holy angels, I'll be ashamed of you. All four of these questions literally deal with the subject of dying to self. And for the Christian, I believe that self is a bigger enemy than Satan. You and I may have some attacks from Satan, probably from one of his emissaries, but you have to deal with self all day long. Every day. So the psalmist learned to focus on the victory of looking to the Lord for satisfaction, giving his life away, making eternity count for more than today. I want to read Psalm 16, verses 5 to 11, before I close. <clears throat> the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my life. <clears throat> The lines are fallen out to me in pleasant places, yea, I have a good heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Are you a true disciple of Jesus Christ? This crowd always gathered in the name of Jesus. After three and a half years of ministry, the best I can discover, Jesus had 120 disciples. You read Acts 1 15, it says that they he had told them together till they began to use with power from on high, and they were in that upper room, and it says there were 120 of them. A lot of crowd. The commotion. But when it came down to commitment, there wasn't a lot of true disciples. I challenge you to get to be a true disciple of Christ and realize that if you value Him and follow Him, you're investing your life in the wisest investment you can make. Don't let others tell you you're throwing your life away when you put Christ first 
and seek to follow you. Let's stand and be dismissed with prayer. Well, you can remain seated. We won't have a business here. Uh, let me pray. Father, thank you for allowing us this time together tonight to study your word. And I pray, God, that you might bless as we seek to be true disciples. Jesus made it clear, and yet we confuse the issue many times by trying to uh, figure out too much when we just need to follow him, deny ourselves, and do what he tells us. Lord, bless us now as we go into the business session. Your will be done in Christ's name.